Hello there, welcome to the June 2005 video tutorial service. This will be video number four in the series. My name is Keith, I'm your host. Um, this month we're going to be wrapping up our conversation about posing in a general sense. We're still going to always keep talking about these things even as we move forward, but this is the big, the big section on, on posing in particular. Um, this month we're going to tie up a few loose ends. We're going to actually start even talking about some thumbnailing and planning and show you some things I think about when I go ahead and start planning my poses. Uh, so without any further delay, let's get going. One of the things about staging that's really important for us to take a, take a look at is, you know, you, right there is the camera, see, camera. And things that the camera can see, the camera can see. Things that the camera can't see, the camera can't see. So if I'm going to play an action, playing it back here isn't going to do us any good, simply because we can't see it. We've only got this one two-dimensional plane of view. So when you, when you pose your character, when you gesture with your character, when you stage things, you want to be sure that you give yourself enough uh, understanding of where the camera is so that you, so that you do things. Uh, one, a common mistake I see a lot is you'll see a character come up and they'll come up in profile. And profile, like I said last, last month, doesn't look all that good. So you open them up a little bit. Try and get that chest out a little bit. Try and get a little bit of torso twist. You know, try and get some things going in there that are more interesting. But when, say, somebody has to reach over and grab something or shake a hand, for instance, I'll see a lot of people use the forward hand of the character, the one towards camera, they'll use this one to kind of do the job and it ends up, notice how that just closes me off. That just turns my chest away, it actually turns my head away. You got this big giant beefy python muscle, I'm sorry, you got this big arm in the way and it starts closing things off. Now, it's really common if people are say, I'm, I'm right handed, so if I come in and I act out a scene, I'm going to shake a guy's hand, I'm going to come over and I'm going to reach in with my right hand to shake his hand. Now, there are times you can't avoid that, but think about these things. When you're right hand, well then maybe there's a way to board him or have him come in the other way so, so that he comes with his right hand and then you, you have here is you can extend the hand forward this way. You're using the back arm to reach for something and all of a sudden, hey look, at, I'm still open to the screen. My face is still open to the screen. This is staged out very nicely, very easy to see, very easy to work with versus this where I'm closing off and you know these, this big giant blob of nothing back there called my back it's not terribly interesting to look at this it's still not terribly interesting to look at especially in my case but this is a better staging for the moment so think about that when you're reaching for things or when a character plays an action or when they do things try not to turn their back to the camera because not unless it's a story point, because a story point, you know, there's times in a story where you want them to turn their back because you don't want to see what they're doing. There is a mystery there. But a lot of times we want to be able to see what the people are doing. And to be able to see what they're doing, we want to stage it in such a way that they're still open to the camera. So use that backside arm to do particular actions or favor it. So if you're going to play with something, play with the back here so that it still works a little bit. Here's a little quick trick for facial staging. This is something I learned when I was working on VeggieTales because they're just bouncing balls with eyes. And they don't too look too good from the side. In fact, they looked horrible from the side. The, the structure of the, of the character just fell apart. So what you do to indicate eye lines, you don't necessarily need to look right down the nose at something. Okay, I've got this little piece of something up in my room here, up on the ceiling that I'm going to look at. Now, it's very natural for us in real life to kind of look at something down the end of our nose. You know, we turn and move our head, but you'll notice that when I do that, what happens is that I'm starting to go very profile. And if I'm talking with another character, and then another character is turning to me, and if I look at them like this, right down the end of my nose, I'm losing the backside eye. Notice, I'm one-eyed Pete now, because the other eye is stuck behind my giant nose. Um, so we don't really like that to happen. In animation, we like to stage things. I mean, you could play with taking one eye forward and back. That's good. That stuff's good. But you don't want to become one-eyed peep because for some reason, we lose connection with characters as thinking human people. Um, when we go down to one eye. Now, sometimes you can't avoid it. I mean, an action sometimes just requires that that's what you do. But if you're having dialogue, try to do this with the eyes. Notice what I'm doing? 
I'm using my eyes and looking there, but my nose is still going out this way. With my nose going this way and my eyes going that way, I keep both eyes in camera, but you get very clear eye lines as to who I'm talking to or what I'm looking at. And that's a neat little trick for staging. I mean, yes, I could do this. And yes, in life I do this, but this is animation. We don't want to be doing just exactly what we do in life. We want to try and accentuate it and make it better if possible. So yes, I'd look at something like that. And there are times where you do want that little comedic effect where the nose dips and rides along, like, huh? But if you're gonna do that, try to do that into camera. So if you're like this, huh? So now you go from one eye to two eye, rather than from two to one, you know what I'm saying? So just to recap on that, don't look down the nose if that looking down the nose is going to make one of the eyes disappear behind the nose. Because we, like I said, we like to see both eyes and we like to see them in such a way that we can really key in on this person and what they're thinking because these things are, the, this right here, this is how you read what's going on in the soul of a character. I mean, everything plays a part of it, but we really look here. And if we take one of those and we cover it up and take it away, we lose 50% of our ability to read what that character's thinking and feeling. So it's important for us to know that we wanna, we wanna key in what that character's thinking and doing. So on our staging, let's try and keep the eyes forward to the camera, at least so we can see them, and then use the eye directions to indicate what we're looking at without necessarily aiming our nose at what we're looking at. Does that make sense? Good. I want to talk a little bit about um, how I tend to think of things when I'm thumbnailing. I got my whiteboard here, my little whiteboard pen, and I'm going to just do a really quick atrocious thumbnail kind of thing for you to kind of give you an understanding of what I tend to think of um, when I'm thumbnailing my poses. Now check, check this out. One of the, one of the first things I, I tend to think of is, okay, where's my, where's my line of action? So let's say I'm going to have a character whose line of action is pretty strong like so, but it's not super strong, okay? One of the things that helps me understand what I want to do with the character is I think of the head, the chest, and the hips as three weights on that line of action, three balls. So we put the head, we put the chest, and we put the, the hips. And by doing this, I understand when I finally get into, into posing my character in 3D where I need to put these things in relationship to each other. And with any line of action, you can put these three things on those lines. So let's say we want a, a little more stronger line of action. You know, say if a guy's pulling something, you know, say that he's going to pull this box. Okay, I want a really strong sweeping line of action. So we're going to put the head there, we're going to put the chest there, we're going to put the hips there, and of course, you know, that's what we got. You know, so we've got the head, those are the arms, there's your chest area, there's the hips. And so that helps me understand how I want to pose my character by taking this strong line of action and then placing those three weights on that line of action to help me work out the relationship between the head and the chest and the hips. And that will work for, for big stuff like that. It will work for simple stuff. Let's say we want a character who's just standing. Fairly simple straight line of action. So we take this, take that, and take that, and even that you can even accentuate a little bit. So let's say we want a character to just stand, but we want a little bit stronger line of action. Notice how we kick this over, and we kick this over, and we start giving it some, some sense of weight to itself. And then, you know, if you want to see how this plays out with, with the rest of the character, you know, just you know, gesturing and doing his thing. So you can kind of fill it out. You know, you, you put your line of action, you put your three weights on that line and you can figure things out. And it really helps me figure out how I want to distribute the weight of something. And I'll, I'll use it as a diagnostic tool as well. If I'm getting into trouble and if my scene isn't working, the first thing I'm going to think of, why is this pose so dead? Why is it so bleh? Why is it not interesting? One of the first things I'll look at is I'll look at that three weights on a line relationship. If it's, if it's just, you know, if the head is right over the chest, is right over the hips, I know I'm pretty much in trouble because I'm not really doing anything with the character. So I'll tend to, you know, do something with moving the, the chest or the, or, or the head off or something to kind of give it some more flow. 
And that's something for you when you're thinking of your thumbnailing. And you don't need to get too crazy. You notice my thumbnails aren't like super fantastic and I'll use this for any kind of character. And the great thing is this will work for any proportion of character. You can use, you can use big headed, small chest, small hips, still gives you the same thing. You can use big butts, small chest, small head. It gives you the same thing. So it helps you to figure out, doesn't matter the proportion of the character. You can take the weight and distribute it anywhere you like. You could take a, a heroic character, some guy who's you know really big and strong and he's got this giant powerful chest and little hips and he's got a head up here and you can make him big, powerful, tough, strong guy. You can use the three weights on a line anywhere and it'll help you figure out what you want to do with your character as far as staging them and posing them and giving them a really strong sense of presence. I use that a ton when I'm thumbnailing and I hope it's helpful to you too. This stinks. Ew. Okay, last thing I think we'll cover this month is the notion of introverted and extroverted posing. You're not going to really see this in books too much, and this is kind of something I came up with. Well, I, I won't say I came up with it, but it's, these are labels that I've attached to these things, uh, introverted versus extroverted posing. Um, again, one of the most important things about art is building contrast. You want to build the contrast between one thing and another. Contrast is what gives us friction. It gives us the things to move a story forward. Contrast allows us to make the difference between this kind of a pose and this kind of a pose. Notice the contrast is from one side of the screen to the other. You want to build as much contrast into your work as is necessary to move things forward. You don't want to overdo it or else things start getting frenetic and then it's really weird and then you start accenting every single syllable and it's just too much. The notion of introverted versus extroverted poses is something I thought of when I was doing my short film Evelyn. Notice with that film, there's, this, there's this, an aggressive character and a passive character. And the aggressive character a lot of times has very extroverted and, and, and domineering outward poses. Their poses are very outside of the framing box of their body. And you'll notice that the passive or the submissive character tends to draw inside of their body. And that's just, you know, simple. If I'm attacking you, I'm going to reach out and attack you. And it's going it's, if to, if I were to draw a bounding box around how much space my body takes up. If I attack you, I'm increasing that bounding box and I'm reaching out and I'm going to do something to you. And if you're going to defend yourself, you're going to draw inside. I mean, turtles do it. Armadillos do it. All kinds of creatures do it. When they're going to defend themselves, they'll draw up inside of themselves. Now, you can use that sort of thing even inside of a single character having a conversation with themselves. Here's the cool stuff. Yes, it's very obvious when one character is trying to do something to another character, so it's extroverted versus introverted. And so there's the contrast there. But how about if you have just one, one character? And let's say they're going through a scene where they're struggling with an inner emotional demon. And the person that they're talking to um, has maybe triggered off a little something in them. And so this person is trying to defend themselves, but at the same time is struggling with a personal problem inside. So you'll have this person kind of go through, well, you could, yeah, sure, you could be that way, but then, you know, I could also be over here, and, and, and you know, maybe sometimes, maybe sometimes I'm that way, but I'm, you know, maybe, you know, it could be that, well, maybe, maybe you're right, I don't, you could be right, I don't know, but I don't want to be mean like you. You notice what I'm just acting that out. There's times where I'm going out, where I'm taking and I'm uh, attacking a little bit, the other person verbally or even mentally just taking these ideas and throwing them at them. And then there are times where I'm back inside of myself trying to, well, I'm, I don't know, I mean... Notice how there's a difference between closing myself off and opening myself up. And this all kind of relays into staging and all definitely relays into weight. But this introverted versus extroverted, it's how you move a character into their personal space and their mind and out of that personal space to interact with others. And the best stories, I think, are the ones where somebody has to overcome their internal problems to then face and overcome external problems. 
And so as characters move, as we work with our characters, we want to make sure that we understand that inside themselves there are issues for them to work out. And they have to get past their own barriers. And once they move past their own barriers, then they're free to move outward. Think of it as a game. you got to get past level one before you can get to level two. Well, level one is where the story's at. Level two is how you see that character played out. Level one is the struggle inside of a character to overcome something. And that's the guts of the story. Level two is how that decision or how that emotional reaction to this here causes them to react to the world out there. And so you put Finding Nemo, for instance. Great little story of a father who has got his own issues of protection, overprotection. Can't handle the thought of losing his son. Won't let anything bad happen to him. But he has no control over whether something bad happens to him or not. Still, in order to reach out past his fears, get past the sharks, get past the jellyfish, get past all the problems, he has to overcome his internal problems. He has to overcome his internal things. And so if you go through Finding Nemo, I mean, he's a fish. The guys at Pixar are really, really bright. But there's not so much you can do with a fish, but there is. You'll notice that they'll have him swim out, and then they'll have him swim back. And he'll kind of go in, and then he'll swim forward, and then swim back. Same with Dory. We'll do the same with both of them. And that's just a way of saying extroverted versus introverted posing. It's something to look for in your work, something to look for in other people's work, and you'll start to notice that there's where the gears are turning for a character. Let's take a look at a few things for some characters posed in Maya. Let's have another look at our friend Murray here. Uh, this pose right here is definitely an introverted kind of pose. He's looking down, he's, he's noticed that his, his silhouette is fairly clean, not too many things sticking off. Well, it's shoulder pads, but you know, that's just a, a design issue. But he's inside of himself here. He's looking down. This is a, an introspective kind of moment where he's, he's considering something and he's thinking of a word to say. Uh, a lot of times in, in these sorts of uh, interactions with characters, a character will collect his thoughts. Uh, once he has the words he wants to say, then he'll express them. Um, a good way to, to express that in your animation is to, when he's inside of himself, have him inside of himself, inside of a closed off pose, an introverted pose. And then when you want to have him go out, well, go ahead and make sure all these guys are keyed. Okay, they're good. Now what we want to do, well, first let's key our camera. Yay! So we can get back to it. Now let's go ahead and get his pose maybe a little outside of himself. Now, we're not going to actually show his feet, but it's always good to build your poses with weight. That's my opinion. If you build your poses with weight, even the stuff that isn't seen, it shows up on screen. I really believe that's true. Um, when you're cheating the puppet, for some reason, it just it just shows up. And, and you can feel it, even though something isn't working. You just know, you just know it's it's just a cheat, and it feels weightless and and just it isn't working. So definitely take the time to make sure that the weight of your of your of your character's poses work, even if you're not going to show everything. Make sure the weight works. Um, all right, get this hand off over here. Let's say he's gonna. You know, now he's got his words and he's gonna, you know, throw them at the the person he's maybe he's having an argument or something. And we wanna have some sense that you know, he's he's gonna toss out as like, well, you know, or whatever. And we'll just play around with some of these fingers. I always feel awkward doing these things on the computer, but some folks seem to like them. I've gotten a lot of email requests saying well, could you do more stuff where you fart around in Maya? So here I am. I'm farting around in Maya, and uh, hopefully it's of benefit to you folks. Um, sometimes I wonder if I'm not just wasting your time. But hopefully we'll make something good out of it. Um, again, just quick slapdash sort of stuff. All right, move this guy out there. Still like the head tilted back this way, just because it's fun. Okay, so we take all these guys and let's just key them. Okay, so I, it's obvious to me that my camera was really messed up, so let's go back and fix a few things. It's one of the problems of just posing with your. 
you know, you. This is the way I like to have things set up. If you take a look at this, I have a little window here, and then I have this window that I look through. In fact, you know, what I'm going to do. I'm going to work through this just so that you can get a sense of what I like to do. I'll use this as a viewport. Use this as my camera that I render, and then this here is where my curves are working. So that way I can, you know, do things. This also down here I can change into. But I'm not going to get into Maya specifics because that's not what this thing, this whole thing's about. Anyhow. There, that's looking a little better on the staging. So there we go. So we go from an introverted pose to an extroverted pose. So he's like, well, I don't know. Let's go for ice cream. Or maybe matzo? Well, wedding soup. Well, beef jerky. You get the idea. It's good to move a character side and outside themselves um, so that we get some sense of, of what's going on. Man, that elbow's really bugging me. Ah, there we go. Pardon my uh, fetishistic tweak of, uh, of of weight in the pose. Uh, that's not what we want to do. Anyhow, that's uh, that's just a quick primer here on going introverted and extroverted. If you were to draw a bounding box around these things, you'd, you'd kind of get the idea of what's going on here. Draw the bounding box around him. He only takes up so much space. Then he goes out and he takes up almost the entire screen. And that's really something to keep in mind when you want to move your characters forward and when they're having internal dialogue versus external dialogue and sometimes like I mentioned in the live action portion they're having both at the same time but you're gonna to have to choose how you want to represent that um, again not something you're gonna read in any book um, and I'm not even sure it's a principle it's just something I've used to help me figure out how to get a character from point A to point B and um, you know express that thinking that thought that that notion um, and so it's a little trick I use. Hopefully it's useful to you folks. Well, that about wraps it up for this month. I really do thank you for playing along. Um, I hope that this has been helpful to you. I really hope that this has uh, filled in a lot of blanks for you as far as what to think about in your poses and things like that. So far, you guys have been really great with the feedback. Keep sending the feedback. I love to get emails from you. Um, I love to hear what you think could be better about these series. Um, as, these, as these months roll by, you're seeing that the video series is kind of evolving in response to user feedback. So I'd love to hear more back from you guys, even if it's just a good word to say, yay, Keith, we like you. Um, it makes me feel special. So anyways, thanks a bunch. Um, stick around. Next month we start getting into some timing aspects of things. Uh, we're going to cover timing for a while uh, because timing is a big part of it. Pose and timing, those are the big parts of animation. So we're going to cover that for a while. And then after timing, we're going to start getting into planning and acting and, and getting into the performance part of things. And that will be probably towards the end of 2005 as we start rolling into the fall. And then after that, just to let you guys know what's coming up, we're going to start talking about uh, how to polish things out, the little details of taking your animation to that next level, things to look for. And we're going to cover facial animation. And then we're going to get down into the nitty gritty of actually taking a practice scene that I take and pretty much animate for you and you'll see how it goes. That's, is, that's the future of what the VTS is going to be holding for you. A uh, couple of things for you to do while you're sitting around waiting for the next video. Uh, some folks have suggested that I give you a little bit of an assignment. So here's something for you to think about. I want you to kind of play around if you have a couple of characters, even if it's the same rig. Play around with a happy character coming up to a sad character trying to introduce himself and shake his hand. Play around with introverted versus extroverted posing. Ch play around with a lot of the things we've talked about as far as, you know, the line of action. Um, talk, you know, play around with uh, the staging of things. Make sure, how, you know, how, which one do you shoot close off and which one do you open up to the camera. Um, just go ahead and practice around with that. And hey, you know what, if, if you want, you can go ahead and send me what you got. Uh, I can't promise you that I'll give you a, a huge critique on it, but it'd be neat to see what people do. Anyhow, I hope this has uh, been a real blessing to you. Uh, I still have a lot of fun doing them, and I hope you have a lot of fun watching them. I hope it's really good for you. All the same, see you next month. All the best and God bless.